Hi, good. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Mikita. I'm George Walwright. Welcome to the College of Physicians in Philadelphia. My quick, unscientific poll. How many have never been here again? Please raise your hand. Never, never been here before. Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Shame on you, but thank you for letting us know. <laughs> we are the oldest professional society in the United States. We started in 1787. Originally, it was a group of doctors who were university educated and wanted to differentiate themselves from other physicians who were uneducated or storefront educated. And they got 17 books from John Morgan, which made it immediately the largest uh, medical library in the Mid-Atlantic state. It then grew to being primarily a library with meeting rooms, but after the Second World War, many of the medical schools with your tax dollars in mind developed their own medical libraries, and increasingly the role of the college changed. It is now changing rapidly, in some people's minds too rapidly, into a medically-based, medically-oriented, scientific, cultural, and social organization, where in this room we have lectures on medical science. We also have concerts from chamber musicians from the Philadelphia Orchestra, discussions about LGBTQ issues for youth and professions who serve them. So we run the gamut. Most people know of us through our Moody Museum, but even hundreds of thousands of Morton knows through our history of vaccine website, which is run by Carrie Youngdahl. We thought it important to talk about the Zika virus, and we thought it was also important to honor the Studenegger Izzard family, the endowment that they gave, which is carefully described in your programs. If, and the family is here today, we would like you to st stand and get recognized for the work that was done and
Caribbean, Latin America, but most of us, for most of us, Zika is a very mild uh, infectious agent. We probably have a lot more important arboviruses to think about if we go to the Caribbean and Latin America, like uh, dengue and chikungunya viruses. So Zika virus was discovered a long time ago in 1947, at a time when the Rockefeller Foundation was sponsoring research in the tropics all over the world to discover new viruses and understand their transmission. And yellow fever virus had been uh, discovered around 1900 and shown to be mosquito-borne by Walter Reed. But it, at this time in the mid-20th uh, century, there was uh, what we call an enzootic cycle discovered for yellow fever, where it circulates in monkeys and forest habitats in Africa. And some of these studies involved hoisting rhesus monkeys up into the canopy, and one of them came down with Zika, and the virus was isolated from that animal. And then uh, a year later, Aedes africanus, uh, one of the forest-dwelling mosquitoes, uh, was found also to be infected by Zika virus, closing the loop on the mosquito-borne transmission cycle. The first human cases were not documented until the following decade in the 1950s, and across in West Africa and in Nigeria. And if you look at the uh, list of signs and symptoms here that were described in those early cases, this has not changed at all from what we recognize today as a typical clinical spectrum of disease for Zika virus, which involves usually a mild dengue-like illness with fever, rash, conjunctivitis, which leads to redness of the eyes, some mild joint pains, and other flu-like symptoms. But still today, we recognize that about 80% of all infections are asymptomatic. People don't know they're infected at all, and they go about their lives normally. And some of the recent estimates began with some outbreaks I'm going to tell you more about in a moment. Uh, Zika virus is a virus that we, uh, we knew very little about until the last decade. Before 2007, there were only 14 total uh, diagnosed human cases in, in history. And in fact, I'd like to point out that you'll notice the spelling of the Zika forest sign here in Uganda has two eyes. We, we, said we know so little about this virus, we can't even spell its name correctly. <laughs> Z-double-I-K-A, but the British scientists who discovered Zika somewhere along the way dropped one of the eyes. And we've only known recently about the, the potential for this virus to enter an urban transmission cycle. And this is where all the risk comes and now in America is, uh, we're seeing some severe neurologic diseases. So what we learned about Zika beginning in the 1940s and continuing um, with some studies that I became involved with about 10 years ago in Senegal with the Institute Pasteur is that Zika virus, like many others, originates in this enzootic or somatic transmission cycle. And in Senegal, there are three other viruses that have the identical cycle here. They probably are familiar to many of you. Yellow fever, a frequent uh, visitor to Philadelphia in the 18th century and many other parts of the Americas. Uh, dengue, also a frequent visitor here in the distant past. And then chikungunya, a virus that is basically two years ahead of Zika and spreading into the Americas for the first time in, in at least uh, one century and infecting people all over Latin America and the Caribbean. So all these viruses circulate in this African transmission cycle. They use a variety of Aedes mosquitoes as their vectors. These are mosquitoes you've probably never heard of because they stay in forests in Africa. They don't generally get involved in human transmission very often. And then there, in Senegal, there are three different non-human primates that play important roles as an amplification host. Pontus monkeys, African green monkeys, and guinea baboons. And these uh, species differ a little bit in different parts of Africa, but basically the same cycle occurs all over uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We also know from our surveillance work in Senegal that people who enter the forest for various activities or who live nearby become infected when these vectors, and one of them particularly is Christopher, moves from the forest to the villages nearby people develop this dengue-like mild illness. And uh, the real risk, though, is that when people are exposed to this virus, if they move to a truly urban habitat, then two different mosquitoes can become involved transmitting Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And one 
once this uh, cycle ensues and lots of people are infected, some of them will get on an airplane and travel halfway around the world, and it only takes one infected person to initiate an outbreak in a place like Brazil traveling from French Polynesia, which is how we think the current outbreak started. So these two mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, are very close relatives. Uh, you can see they're both very beautiful mosquitoes. Uh, they have some important differences, though. Aedes aegypti originated in sub-Saharan Africa, but many centuries ago, along with yellow fever and dengue viruses, it was distributed around the world by sailing ships that came into ports like here in Philadelphia. The mosquitoes arrived, the virus arrived, and you had an outbreak right here in Philadelphia of yellow fever or dengue. Aedes albopictus originated in Asia, and only recently spread around the world, beginning in around 1985 when it was identified in, in the port of Houston and used tires that had been shipped from Asia for retreading. And now it has spread up into the northern parts of uh, north, northeastern North America. It was introduced into uh, Brazil and spread throughout South America, many parts of Africa, even southern Europe. So Aedes albopictus can occur a little bit further north or south of the southern hemisphere because its eggs can survive colder winters than Aedes aegypti, which is really a tropical and subtropical mosquito. But the most important differences between these two vectors, which we think are the main vectors of Zika virus, are their behavior and their ecology. So if you wanted to design an ideal vector for transmitting a virus like dengue or Zika, you really couldn't design a mosquito that would be much better than Aedes aegypti, uh, except that perhaps it would per occur further north in, in temperate areas like Albopictus. But it has several traits that make it a perfect vector. First of all, it's, it feeds almost exclusively on people, and in the urban cycle, people are the only amplifying host, so it focuses on the right host. It doesn't waste its feeding effort on hosts that are not involved in the, the virus cycle. It tends to feed more than once within a gonotropic or a reproductive cycle. So most mosquitoes that you encounter will, will bite you, they will completely engorge with blood. Then they'll go away for the uh, best part of a week, digest that blood, use the protein to make their eggs, lay their eggs, and then they'll go back and look for another host. Aedes aegypti, on the other hand, often feeds by taking partial blood meals within a one or two day time period for multiple people. So that increases its chance of getting infected by a virus like Zika. Then it will go and, and incubate, digest, make its eggs, and then it'll be back for a subsequent blood meal and also feed on multiple people. So if it has become infected, it'll transmit to more than one person. So this makes it capable of amplifying the transmission cycle very rapidly and explosively. The larvae, the aquatic stages of mosquitoes, are usually found in artificial containers or in people's backyards or the storm sewer near their house. And so the larvae, once they emerge into adult mosquitoes, uh, will, enter, will enter houses. It's the adult females that bite. And they'll often stay inside someone's house for the remainder of their lifetime. So they're in close association with people where they have ready access to biting them for additional blood meals, additional reproduction. And these artificial containers, something as small as a bottle cap can contain enough rainwater to support the development of several Aedes aegypti larvae. So they're, they're extremely well adapted to exploit uh, the way that we live and what we discard on our properties. Aedes albopictus is probably a secondary vector of Zika, and it's equally susceptible to aegypti. That is, when the virus is present in a blood meal, it can become infected, and it can transmit it about a week of incubation, but its behavior is not as conducive. So uh, the only thing that uh, is superior is it has a wider geographic distribution like I showed you, but it feeds more opportunistically, so not just people, it will, it will bite birds, dogs, cats, other animals uh, near your house. It usually doesn't have this multiple blood feeding during one gonotropic cycle, so that reduces its chance of getting infected or multiple <coughs> transmissions. It uses a wide variety of both natural and artificial uh, water containers for its habitats, the larval habitats. And it doesn't have this tendency to come inside your house and stay there like Aedes aegypti does. 
And both of these mosquitoes, it's important to note, are unusual in that they feed during the daytime. Most of the time we think of mosquitoes being a risk to us, like Q-Lens mosquitoes transmitting West Nile virus as being nighttime inviting mosquitoes. We have to worry when we go out in the evening about protecting ourselves. With Aedes aegypti, we have to worry about all day long, and we have to worry about mosquitoes being inside our house or inside our hotel room transmitting these viruses. So Zika virus is a flavy virus uh, named after uh, yellow fever, the root flavy. Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree of all the flavy viruses, and I simply want to point out some of its close relatives, which include viruses uh, familiar to us here in North America, like St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile virus, dengue viruses, and yellow fever virus. So, Although we don't know a lot about Zika virus, we do know quite a bit about many of its relatives, and that's uh, part of the reason for some optimism that we can develop a vaccine for, yellow, for Zika virus using methods that we use for other flavy viruses. This is a phylogenetic tree just of different strains of Zika virus. These trees are developed by sequencing the genetic material of the virus, using the genetic code to decipher the evolutionary history, making more or less a genealogy like you have for your family here. And what we learn from these kind of studies is that there are two main lineages of Zika virus. One we call the Asian and now the American lineage, and another that we call the African lineage. And the closest relatives of Zika are other African viruses that occur in the same forests in sub-Saharan Africa, which leads us to conclude that Zika virus almost certainly originated in, in Africa, probably at least millennia ago or possibly longer. We also learned a long time ago, based on sera surveys, taking blood samples from people who live in different parts of Africa and Asia and seeing if they have antibodies in their blood, which would indicate past exposure to Zika. That if you look in the red here, you'll see that people have antibodies in many different parts of Africa and in Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia as well. In orange here are places where those 14 human cases I mentioned were diagnosed or where the virus was detected either in mosquitoes or humans or not human primates. So you can see basically the virus is widely distributed in Asia and Africa. And then recently, I'll show you in a moment where these outbreaks have spread. So, what, what we learned from these detailed phylogenetic studies, I'll show you on the tree here. This is the Zika forest, where it was first discovered in 1947. We think sometime probably uh, 50 to 100 years ago, the virus was spread from Africa into Asia. And then the, the recent key events included, first of all, in Gabon in 2007, there was an outbreak involving a few thousand people that was shown to be transmitted by Aedes albopictus, one of those two urban vectors that I showed you. Then the next key event, the virus was introduced probably from somewhere in Southeast Asia into Yap Island, a very small island in the, uh, the archipelago of Micronesia here, uh, inhabited by about 7,000 people, and the majority of those people became infected by Zika virus based on retrospective studies by the CDC. Then the virus, probably from somewhere else in Southeast Asia, was introduced into French Polynesia in 2013. And I think this is where the risk of Zika really started to grow dramatically, because instead of a few thousand people infected here and here, now we have uh, probably well over 100,000 people infected in French Polynesia. Many French Polynesians travel uh, widely around the world. Many of them were infected without even knowing it. And so they started uh, transporting the virus around the world uh, to other islands in the South Pacific, but eventually to Brazil, probably in late 2013. Now we have, instead of a couple hundred thousand people, uh, susceptible people, we've got hundreds of millions of susceptible people, because to our knowledge, Zika had never been in the Americas before. There was no immune uh, uh, history with this virus. Everyone was naive. And so, very rapidly spread all over North and South America and into Central America and the Caribbean. And then uh, late last year, a small outbreak began in the Cape Verde Islands. And this, we believe, was a virus transported from 
from West Africa, very likely from Senegal, where it should be reworked in the past. And this was an 80s Egypti born outbreak, like we believe all of these are as well. Uh, and it's still ongoing in Cape Verde Islands, which is again a small population. So the current situation in the Americas, we have 38 countries and territories uh, with local transmission documented. You can see that basically all of Northern South America, all of Central America, and even Mexico are involved as well as all of the major Caribbean islands. So this virus has spread throughout the tropics and subtropics. Uh, and I think that with the coming rainy season in the Caribbean, Central America, we're probably going to see a shift from the early transmission being in Brazil to more of these northern regions once the rainy season starts in about a month in these areas. So during this uh, period of spread, um, eight, uh, 38 countries involved. The number of cases in Brazil has been estimated at about a million and a half. Nobody really knows how many here because we don't detect or diagnose many of them, but probably several million more cases. Um, and it's important to know that these several million cases here, only a little over 8,000 have been diagnosed with laboratory tests. That means we're really just taking educated guesses which of these people have Zika, which of them may have dengue, chikungunya, or other mosquito borne, or even non mosquito borne viruses. And this is a big problem the lack of diagnostics uh, to, to characterize what's really going on in these outbreaks. Uh, in the U.S. now we are up to uh, 472 imported cases from all of these regions, and this has included 44 pregnant women. And once travelers have reached the United States, we've now detected 10 cases of sexual transmission, nine of those from men to women and one of those from a man to a man. And so uh, this is the first mosquito-borne virus that's ever been documented to be transmitted sexually. So the problem with Zika is not uh, the millions of people who are getting infected in South America because the vast majority of those people are completely asymptomatic and the remaining 20% or so, the vast majority of those have a very mild disease. In fact, if you go to South America or the Caribbean, you should be more worried about getting chicken than your dengue viruses, mm -hmm. which can cause a very severe debilitating disease, much, uh, much worse for typical person, not in a high risk group, compared to Zika virus. But the problem with Zika virus is what was recognized since French Guiana are two important neurologic diseases. The first um, was uh, when the virus reached uh, Brazil in, uh, about a year ago and started causing a major outbreak in the Northeast. All, again, all the cases originally described were these mild rash fever type illnesses. But about five or six months later, in October, physicians in the area noticed an increase in the rate of microcephaly. And microcephaly simply means uh, babies being born or developing in utero with small heads. Uh, the initial definition was less than two standard deviations from the mean for uh, any baby of a given gestational age. And so babies were, were being born starting about October, and then, as I'll show you, the evidence linking this to Zika initially was just that Zika virus had just arrived a few months earlier. All the places where microcephaly was being detected were also places where Zika virus was circulating. But now there's much stronger evidence by finding the virus or its genetic material in many of these uh, fetuses and babies uh, after birth. And now probably there's good evidence for at least half of these cases of microcephaly being directly linked to Zika virus. And that's really what triggered the WHO and the CDC to uh, a few weeks ago acknowledge that there was strong evidence that Zika virus was causing this directly. The second one is called gown gray syndrome. This is a, an autoimmune disease of the peripheral nervous system. And it's been known for a long time to be triggered by various viral infections, um, various other infections. And it's thought that what happens is the immune system uh, starts recognizing our own uh, com uh, components as foreign and attacking the myelin sheath on our peripheral nerves. And that leads to either partial or sometimes almost complete paralysis. Severe cases require ventilation because the lungs don't function normally. Uh, these are 
are occasionally fatal, but most people do eventually recover. Usually a period of years, though, is required for that rehabilitation. So it's very expensive and a very uh, a long uh, recovery period. So this is the, uh, the epidemic curve for Brazil uh, last spring, about a year ago. You can see the cases uh, of Zika-like disease that weren't even diagnosed at this point began in the late winter here, and then they started to peak in April and May. And if you uh, superimpose on this graph mosquito populations in this part of Brazil, they would be almost a, a, a mirror image here for Zika. So this is the rainy season. A lot of Hades aegypti eggs hatch, a lot of larvae are produced, and a lot of adult mosquitoes emerge. And so the epidemic peak you can see around early May, exactly a year ago, and then declined uh, as the dry season came on later in the summer. So uh, the, the number of confirmed cases uh, during this particular outbreak was, was only eight, but the media uh, learned about this in, in early June, and this is when we started to see all these photographs of uh, babies severely underdeveloped heads and brains appearing on the internet, and I think this is when the fear of Zika really got started, when these images started coming out of Brazil. I'm just going to mention a couple of the important clinical studies that were done on these cases in Brazil. Uh, this was probably the first really well-documented case of uh, a woman who traveled from Slovenia to Brazil during the same time period last year. Uh, then she returned to Slovenia, she was being monitored by an ultrasound, and at 29 weeks gestation, note how, how long this is in the gestation period, it's late in gestation, uh, some uh, ultrasound hemorrhages starting a period, started appearing abnormal, uh, especially with calcification, these little white spots here uh, in the brain on ultrasound represent depositions of uh, calcium in the brain, uh, a gyria or loss of the normal uh, surface appearance of the brain, multifocal cor cortical dystrophic calcifications, cortical displacement, major parts of the brain being moved from one part of the skull to another, and of course the cerebral cortex being severely underdeveloped, and also some inflammation. Uh, the viral RNA was detected by PCR in the brain consistent with these findings, and in fact, they were able to amplify the entire genome of the virus and show that it was almost identical to strains in Brazil, uh, closing the loop on that link to infection in Brazil when this patient uh, resided there for a few weeks. And then immunohistochemical staining, which identifies the locations where the viral proteins are, which means where the virus is replicating, uh, they showed uh, various parts of the brain where the virus has been infecting and producing proteins including in astrocytes, extending into the subarachnoid space, in microglial cells, and macrophages in the cortex, and subcortical white matter, and then accent, axons in the lumbar spinal cord. So this was really one of the first smoking guns showing that Zika virus was in the brain of these babies, was actively replicating, and it was damaging cells in the brain. A couple of epidemiologic studies of particular importance. So this was the first one that um, was done in French Polynesia. It was very interesting that French Polynesia detected the Alvare syndrome very soon after the outbreak began there, but they never reported microcephaly until the virus arrived in Brazil. And last fall, all these cases of microcephaly started appearing. The French Polynesian uh, physicians and other healthcare workers went back and looked at their records during their outbreak, which was from uh, October 2013 to April 14. And in fact, when they looked carefully at the records, they did find cases of microcephaly. Um, they found that about two thirds of the total population uh, in the islands was infected. There were eight microcephaly cases identified. Seven of them were in this particular time window when the peak of the outbreak occurred. And doing some modeling of the epidemiologic data, they reported that the risk was highest in the first trimester of pregnancy. And uh, that when they compared the baseline levels of microcephaly, it's important to note that microcephaly has been known for a long time to be caused by many other viral and parasitic infections. For example, one of the major causes was rubella virus before a vaccine was implemented in the 1960s. 
But um, when they looked at the, the baseline, which these days can be cytomegalovirus, herpes viruses, toxoplasmosis, other things, they found that the risk had increased significantly during the outbreak. And, and in the end, they estimated that the risk for any infected pregnant woman infected during the first trimester of her baby developing microcephaly was about 1%. And the risk was mainly for first trimester, which was kind of good news in a way, at least the, the window of high risk had been narrowed a bit, not just the entire duration of pregnancy to the first trimester. And this, this uh, risk seemed lower than many people would have expected based on the number of cases being reported. However, another study uh, done more recently seems to contradict those findings. This one was, unlike the first, which was a case control study, this was a prospective cohort study where a group of pregnant women was identified in Brazil uh, very early in pregnancy, and then they were followed using frequent uh, ultrasound to determine which ones developed any fetal abnormalities and which ones became infected with Zika virus. And what, what was found at the end of this was that 42 of these women uh, did become infected with Zika virus, and 29% uh, of, of these developed some kind of abnormality. And unfortunately, unlike the French Polynesia study, this shows you the weeks of gestation, and the dark colored bars show bad outcomes with neurological disease. So it's not just first trimester like the French Polynesians reported, it's throughout pregnancy. Even very late in pregnancy, there were bad outcomes, um, a, a wide variety of different things here, ranging from uh, in utero growth restriction, with or without microcephaly, some of the same things I showed you here. Uh, even severe defects in the development of the limbs, of the legs and the, the arms were detected in these studies. And these were all confirmed then after the babies were born uh, to be the same kind of defects. So this study suggests that there's risk throughout pregnancy, not just first trimester. And uh, although this study only studied women who became infected with Zika virus, so the rates of, of adverse disease were much higher because they're leaving out the asymptomatic infections, which seem to have a lower risk. Uh, this, this number here, 29%, was quite disconcerting to the medical community in Brazil. This is just an example of a typical course of infection, how these uh, fetal infections occur typically. So on the top here, you see uh, the, uh, the data from the infant, which began with ultrasound at about 12 and a half weeks here, which was normal. Another ultrasound later on, which was normal. The first signs that something were, was going wrong here was about 20 weeks of gestation, where there were uh, severe fetal abnormalities detected by ultrasound, and the virus itself was detected in the amniotic fluid at this time point. Remember that uh, ultrasound typically cannot detect these, these brain uh, deficiencies anytime before late second trimester. And it's generally not considered safe to do um, amniocentesis earlier in pregnancy as well. So we don't have much of a capability to diagnose this in these infants until fairly late in, in pregnancy, often past the window even in this country where the, the pregnancy can be terminated if the mother wishes to do so. So that, that's a major problem that we have is that we can't provide the information that the family would like to have in time to make a decision to terminate a pregnancy. And then uh, later on, um, this particular uh, fetus was aborted and uh, all of the, the findings I just showed you before were detected. This particular woman um, traveled from Europe to South America. She was uh, in Guatemala and other parts of the region and uh, undoubtedly became infected sometime um, during this time here, so very early, the first trimester pregnancy. Um, she was diagnosed with infection at this point herself based on detecting antibodies and the viral genetic material here. And she developed a prolonged viremia or virus in her bloodstream, and I'll get more into that finding in a moment, which can be very important. So Zika virus infection, um, this is a, a sort of a nonspecific diagram showing you what happens in any flaky virus infection, and it was really made for dengue but I want to point out a couple key differences with Zika. So normally when we're infected one of the 
one of these viruses by a mosquito bite. That occurs somewhere over here. We're, we're defining day zero as when the patient uh, knows that they have signs and symptoms and they seek medical care. So the infection occurs out here and there's viremia that occurs before patients usually seek treatment or diagnosis. And that viremia period usually lasts roughly a week, maybe 10 days or so. When there's virus in the bloodstream and a mosquito biting this person during this time period can be infected and propagate the cycle. Then eventually our immune system uh, kicks in and we clear the virus when we start producing antibodies. First we produce a class of antibodies called IgM followed by IgG. So uh, if, if you travel to Latin America and you think you may have been infected, if you come to a clinic early on, we can test for the presence of virus in your blood. There's a very good PCR test for that. If you come a little bit later though, the only way we can diagnose you is to find this antibody response. And if you live in a part of the world where there are not a lot of other plaguey viruses, like here in the US or perhaps in Europe, uh, we can usually diagnose you very efficiently by detecting this IgM. But if you live in a part of the world where uh, there's dengue virus, maybe yellow fever, maybe other plaguey viruses, that dengue immunity will cross-react in the Zika test. So, Basically, anyone in the Caribbean or Latin America, if we don't diagnose them during this phase, it's very unlikely that we can diagnose them based on their antibodies. And furthermore, if we were to go to Brazil today and say, how many people have already been infected with Zika virus, this cross-reaction would prevent us from answering that question. We couldn't tell whether they were infected last spring during that outbreak I showed you, or whether they were infected by dengue, and dengue was cross-reacting in the Zika test. But the, the, the notable differences for Zika are, first of all, when pregnant women become infected, they have a prolonged viremia. So this viremia, instead of ending here, can persist for several months throughout the, the pregnancy. And that means that that woman can infect mosquitoes for a much longer time period. And that may be assisting in the efficiency of mosquito transmission. Uh, second, we know that Zika virus can be present in the saliva, the urine, the breast milk, and also prolonged uh, in the semen. And we don't know exactly how long sexual transmission can go on, but uh, to be safe, uh, the CDC is recommending that men uh, who are partners of pregnant women either abstain or use condoms for the duration of pregnancy, because we don't know long, how long this risk lasts. Um, urine seems to be especially useful because when viremia ends, urine is often present for a longer time period, and this is an easy fluid to collect for diagnostics and even for epidemiologic screening. So why, why did Zika virus show up all of a sudden the last couple of years after going for six decades with only 14 cases and remaining one of the most obscure of these viruses? I think there are two main hypotheses for what happened. One is that the virus changed recently, that, that it evolved to either become more infectious for urban mosquito vectors like Aedes aegypti. And there's a precedent for this that we uh, described for chikungunya virus, which before it started spreading around the world, it adapted to better infect Aedes albopictus through a series of mutations. And we've, uh, we've explored that hypothesis for Zika, and so far we have no evidence that Zika has the same pattern. The other possibility is that it just replicates to higher levels in the human body that leads to higher amounts of virus in the blood and a better chance of crossing over the placenta into the fetus to cause these severe outcomes. And there's, there's no really direct evidence for or against that part of the hypothesis. But the other one, which I tend to favor now, is that uh, this virus has been capable of causing the same kind of diseases for, uh, for many years in Africa and Asia before it spread into the Americas. But it was never detected because we, we never saw a huge epidemic where there were millions of people infected in a short time period, leading to an obvious increase in the, the amount of microcephaly in a population. Remember, microcephaly is always there at a low level. We only noticed uh, this in Brazil after it reached about 20 times higher than that normal level. And it wasn't even noticed in French Polynesia until they retrospectively took a very close look at their data. So I think it's entirely possible that small numbers of cases occur in Africa and Asia all the time. We don't
don't have the diagnostics in place to, to determine what causes these, and there, there are not enough cases really to get the attention of the public health and medical communities there. And I think the best evidence for this is just the past couple of weeks, this outbreak I showed you in the Cape Verde Islands, which is in the 80s a gym type born outbreak, they have now detected two cases of microcephaly. And this is a West African strain of Zika virus. It's not one uh, that's closely related to the ones causing the severe disease in Brazil and other parts of America. So this suggests to me that probably any Zika virus has this potential to cause severe neurological disease. So what, what's the, uh, the risk to us here in the United States? What, what can we look for going forward? Well, returning again to this virus called chikungunya, I think this is our best indication of what may happen here in the U.S. with Zika virus in the coming years. So chikungunya was basically two years ahead of Zika in arriving in the Americas. Um, it had been circulating in Asia for many years, and we had some imported cases since 2006. But when it arrived in the Caribbean, we saw a huge jump in the number of imported cases into the U.S. These are mostly air travelers. And, uh, and then in 2014, beginning right about the same time of year, we saw some local chains of transmission in Florida where 12 people became infected through mosquito bites. And uh, so if you compare that to Zika, uh, Zika virus arrived a little later, so far 472 cases, but remember, we're missing all of those asymptomatic cases, which may be capable of starting a mosquito transmission cycle. We don't know yet. In the case of chikungunya, there are very few asymptomatic cases, so we probably caught almost all of them two years ago. So the numbers of imported cases may be even higher now for Zika virus than they were for chikungunya two years ago. We haven't seen any local transmission so far, but I think we're just getting into the peak risk period, especially in the southern United States. This is the current estimated distribution for Aedes aegypti here. You'll notice that uh, Philadelphia is near the northern end of the distribution. Even New York falls within this blue portion of the map. That doesn't mean that the populations in these areas are anywhere near as large as they are in the south. And our history with chikungunya and dengue indicates that We've only seen outbreaks in the southern part of the United States in the past few decades. We saw one case of a locally acquired dengue in Long Island a few years ago, but other than that, it's always been in the south. Aedes albopictus occurs much further north here, but as I explained, the, the behavior of Aedes aegypti is not as good for transmitting these viruses, so I wouldn't expect these areas to be at high risk compared with Aedes aegypti transmitting along the Gulf Coast in the southern parts of the southwestern uh, United States. So what are our prospects for, for controlling this outbreak? What can we do in the near term? Unfortunately, the, the news is not very good. Our, our only options really in the near term for the next year or two are to improve mosquito control using the methods that we've developed for other mosquito-borne diseases. But I think most importantly, what we can do is to educate people about the true risk of Zika, not just uh, the, what they read in the headlines, but especially the high-risk people who are pregnant women and their partners. So uh, if at all possible, pregnant women should not travel at all to any of the affected regions I showed you on the yellow map. If they absolutely must travel, they really need to take extreme precautions of wearing long sleeve clothing, wearing repellents judiciously, even inside during the daytime. Remember, this is different than how we protect ourselves for West Nile. And also importantly, although uh, healthy, normal adults and children are not at risk of severe disease from Zika, they can very easily become infected, possibly not even recognizing it, they asymptomatic, and return from an endemic area by remic and capable of initiating mosquito transmission here in the United States. So, we need to educate everyone traveling to these regions that they need to protect themselves from mosquito bites for at least a couple weeks when they return home, even if they're feeling fine with no signs of Zika virus infection. And that's probably the biggest challenge is, is that group of people who have just come back from a vacation. The last thing they're worried about is getting bitten by a mosquito and starting a Zika epidemic in their hometown. In the long term, I think that we can develop a vaccine. I'll talk more about this in a moment. 
Therapeutics will be a, a bigger challenge because it's, it's difficult to find uh, drugs that are safe for use in pregnant women because of the uh, susceptibility of the fetus sometimes to toxic effects. And these might be used, for example, just to treat very high risk people like women who live in an endemic area, become pregnant, or symptomatic persons. And I think in the long run, one of our best possibilities is to improve the ways we control ladies' chip health. So uh, vaccine development, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is we now have some pretty good mouse and non-human primate models available, just developed in the past few weeks. And we know a lot about making vaccines for other flavoring viruses, like yellow fever, we've had a good vaccine for about 80 years. Dengue now is a licensed uh, vaccine in several parts of the world. And those uh, past successes will help us at least narrow the options for the initial vaccine development for Zika. But there are two main challenges here. One is that there are some scientists who are detecting very similar proteins between Zika virus and our own human proteins, and suggesting that Zika virus may actually trigger uh, a reaction against our own proteins that could also be triggered by a Zika vaccine. And so we're going to have to be very careful to make sure we understand what's causing the outbreak. Standing water from your property that's going to help you with reducing risk of West Nile virus, uh, other mosquito borne virus. Um, you know, very simple precautions can be taken that will reduce that risk significantly. One more, I just can't help myself, just one more thing I want to ask. Um, so, um, the thing that's striking to me about this, it's been more than 50 years since we identified a virus that was a teratogen, which is to say it could cause severe permanent. Um, I live in the Philadelphian um, in the early 1960s in Philadelphia. One out of every hundred children born in this city uh, were infected with rubella. The mother was infected with rubella in the first trimester and had uh, congenital birth defects. Um, so it, it's, uh, and, and, and at that point, um, it was understood that if you're infected in the first trimester with rubella, 85% of those children can be born with severe defects of the eye and the heart. This is now the second virus where the there's severe congenital birth defects. So if you're, if you're a friend, so what we struggled with in those days was trying to figure out how to best advise women when they were pregnant and infected with Zika. You've explained that the, the, uh, it's unclear what the, the risk is, anywhere from 1% to 29% based on, I guess, the severity of infection during pregnancy. How would you advise, advise a pregnant woman who was infected with Zika? Well, so part of the problem is diagnostic testing. If, if you return from uh, from an infected area and you're asymptomatic, last I heard, men could not get tested. Um, and women, I think, can get tested now if they return from an epidemic area. Um, and the testing for most Americans who don't have a history in the tropics is very good. If you test negative for the virus and negative for IgM, you're probably 90% chance you're in the clear. You did not get infected during that trip. Men is really a bigger problem for, for getting tested now. We don't know if asymptomatic men can transmit or only symptomatic men. But uh, other than that, um, it's more frequent ultrasounds. And uh, if, you know, if there's a woman who has the option of terminating the pregnancy, hoping that something shows up by 20 weeks, I think is you know, the key time period. But my understanding from talking about obstetricians is that's a very tough challenge to diagnose this by 20 weeks. So, questions from the audience? Dr. Vernon, what will do you next? Thank you. Um, for surveillance purposes, is there a mosquito trapping and testing program underway in the southern United States? The answer is yes and no. Uh, there are some very well funded, very highly developed programs like Harris County, Houston, Texas. We work directly with them to test mosquitoes that they collect in the field to see if they're infected with Zika virus. Unfortunately, mosquito control in the U.S. is a patchwork of generally run at the county level or sometimes the municipality level programs. Uh, surprise, surprise, the ones in the wealthy communities are very highly developed, very sophisticated. They would have the capability if, if we did have local transmission to do some interventions, but Many areas, for example, I visited the Rio Grande Valley a couple months ago. Um, many of the core areas that are most
most at risk for Zika have no mosquito control available, other than maybe the, the county government has one person who uh, one day of the week they do trash pickup and then another day of the week they do some mosquito control and they think they have a problem. So very uneven uh, across the U.S. The CDC doesn't do any vector control. They do advise vector control operations, but uh, this problem we have of everything being local, depending on local resources, I think is, is far from ideal for controlling this kind of a situation. In your slide, when you were talking about the lack of relevant concern about transmission of Zika in the United States, you were relying on the fact that most people, it was um, in South America, Asia, were already already had antibodies, but there was not a North America component on that. So, uh, why do you think we're not as much at risk here in the U.S. for people returning from the Brazilian Olympics? It's just because of our level of contact with mosquitoes, especially Aegis aegypti. Um, it's really our air conditioners and our screens that have protected us from these diseases for uh, about a century now. Um, you know, in the past we had major epidemics of all these viruses in port cities in the U.S., but once screen windows and air conditioners came along, I think that reduced our contact with these mosquitoes to the point where the transmission cycle was very inefficient. It didn't even get started at all at Chikungunya in Florida two years ago. The chain is very short. Uh, even in the absence of mosquito control, it's probably typically short because most people just don't get bitten by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in the U.S. Whereas if you go to uh, Brazil, I was, I was in Brazil a couple months ago. I visited one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city of Salvador, the fourth largest city. And uh, these beautiful, big, beautiful homes, uh, the windows were wide open, the doors were wide open. I went in there and aspirated five or ten Aedes aegypti out of every, out of every room in the house. So just a fundamental cultural difference and economic difference. I'd like to ask one question before we go back to the audience for both of you. And I have, I'm not stealing this from Dr. Oppen, but he brought it up before. Uh, Rachel Carson is the goddess of environmental people. What do you think about the banning of DDT as a result of that? It especially, I guess, given that you can make the statement that, uh, that Aedes aegypti likes to live in the home, so that, that you know, we were able to make, in many ways, eliminate malaria from this country as well as many other countries by spreading DDT on the walls. I mean, what Rachel Carson did in, in Silent Spring was make DDT synonymous with poison, and we eliminated not only for agricultural use, but also public one could argue since we reinstated it in 2006 that it, 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 we shouldn't have eliminated it from, from public health use and that children died needlessly of malaria because of that incident. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a completely legitimate point and something we should be discussing. And unfortunately, DDT became such a dirty word that there was no discussion for decades. But I think that probably the, uh, uh, an intermediate solution would be to use other insecticides uh, that can be applied to walls inside of homes. That's where DDT was really effective. The mosquitoes rest on the walls, they go in your closet. If you can apply a, a semi-persistent insecticide that's not quite as persistent and toxic as DDT, it's been shown several times that it can be very effective for controlling Aedes aegypti in people's homes. The problem is that going home by home, spraying walls in every room is extremely expensive and uh, resource intensive, and it's really probably just not affordable. A lot of places in, for example, Salvador, where a lot of these cases are, are in, uh, in slum areas where the public health officials have trouble going there just because of safety concerns to begin with. So uh, it, it, there are all kinds of problems with, with doing that kind of control, but that's clearly what could have the biggest impact if we had the resources to do house by house indoor spraying, residual spraying on walls and surfaces where we know Aegis aegypti like to stay. I think that DDT, there, there's discussion about using DDT again, but I think that there may be kind of an intermediate uh, choice of something that's not quite as persistent as DDT that might be more acceptable to people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Comment on the progress towards the vaccine with chikungunya, which is a very well, chikungunya is a, is a great example, like Ebola, of a, a 
of our main challenges with vaccine development for these, these sporadically emerging diseases that we can't anticipate very well. And uh, I work on chikungunya vaccines, and I'm as frustrated as anybody else. Um, I, I started working on a chikungunya vaccine in 2007 through NIH funding. I had several NIH grants. I had a vaccine that had um, performed very well in non-human primate models, which the FDA requires before clinical testing. Uh, we knew this vaccine was working well uh, four or five years ago, but we had two challenges. One, uh, convincing a large company to invest hundreds of millions of dollars, typically. Uh, and, and their uh, business people want to know what's the market going to be, not today, but in five or ten years. And in, in reality, we don't know if there will be much of a market unless it's on a WHO recommendation list or something. And so uh, we knew Chicken Venue was coming. It arrived in 2013. But there was no way we could get our vaccine into clinical trials in time to affect that outbreak. And in fact, none of the vaccines are going to affect the chicken venue outbreak. This time, maybe the next one, they will. But we have this regulatory process in this country that's very conservative and very slow. And we need to find a way to be, to be poised to begin clinical trials even before the next virus arrives, not to wait until the epidemics run its course and then try to do something on the tail end when you have to vaccinate a lot more people and you don't know exactly where to go and things like that. It's, it's a big problem and it's very frustrating for the scientists working in this area. But let me actually follow up if I can, sorry, because since you brought it up, with one question. And so, and if you're smart, you won't answer it. But if, if um, you used it, uh, chicken, uh, uh, the, the um, Zika virus is a flavivirus. There are three currently licensed flavivirus vaccines. A Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, and dengue, which are made by three biologically different manners. So you have Japanese encephalitis, a whole killed virus, a yellow fever with a live attenuated virus, and, and, uh, and dengue is a recombinant viral vaccine. If you had to predict with Zika, given what you know about the biology of Zika, and that there are those three existing vaccines, what approach do you think would, would, would likely work best? Well, I think in the long run, a live attenuated vaccine would be the way to go and to give it to children to develop strong herd immunity early in life. And we would never see these kind of major epidemics if we could do that. Um, I think in the short term, though, because any live attenuated vaccine has a higher bar for safety, probably a, a DNA vaccine, a virus-like particle, vaccines that are not capable of any replication in the human body, so there's no real risk of they can be moved through the regulatory pathway much faster. So I think what you hear Tony Fauci talking about and others is that one, one, one or several of those vaccines will be ready for phase one clinical trials by the end of the year. And maybe there will be efficacy data in two or three years to go for a license for one of those vaccines. A certain interim measure to target uh, pre uh, childbearing age girls strategy at the beginning and then eventually uh, move toward the other children and then. So sort of a two-tiered two strategy I think is what makes a lot of sense right now. Bob, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question. I'm a little concerned about the chronic paremia that you described in pregnant women and the fact that then can transmit and receive them for a long period of time, which does suggest that maybe the virus can hide somewhere in the body and avoid the well, there is good evidence that it, it does persist in immunologically privileged sites, and that's probably uh, uh, it's probably the, the fetus and the placenta is seeding the maternal viremia. Uh, the, the mother has probably mounted a reasonable immune response, but the fetus has not. In the case of semen, uh, immunolo immunologically privileged sites in the male reproductive system, um, there, there's been reported severe ocular damage from Zika virus infected uh, in utero and babies. That's also an immunologically privileged site in the eye. So I think a lot of these bad outcomes and persistence have to do with these privileged sites. Same thing that we see with Ebola. Ebola can be present in infectious form for many months in semen, and that's probably why uh, Ebola still hasn't been eradicated in West Africa chronically infected men uh, are transmitting a year after their the onset of illness.
us not even realizing that they're still infectious. But there was a question here also, right? Jim, why don't you put you in? Or we'll have one more question than answer this. Your comment that a vaccine trigger an antibody response that itself increases the risk of Guillain Barre syndrome is sobering. How do we assure ourselves that that's not a, a threat before moving ahead with the human trials of the vaccine? Well, I think the best way to do that is to do some very careful studies of these Guillain Barre cases that are occurring now in, I think, eight countries and determine exactly what the immune response to this, the normal Zika virus infection is and whether it truly is an autoimmune response or something different. I, what I'm hearing lately from Brazilian immunologists studying some of these cases is that the majority don't have uh, this immune response directed against components of the myelin sheath of the nerves, like it, it's sort of the stereotypical Guillain Barre syndrome. But they're thinking that a lot of these are actually direct viral impacts on nerves in the periphery rather than autoimmunity. And that, that would be good news for making the vaccine, but I think there has to be very strong evidence uh, and probably also from animal models that one can be developed to mimic this Guillain Barre uh, triggering event, whatever it is. But uh, a conference a few weeks ago uh, sponsored by the NIH, there were a lot of uh, big pharma vaccine developers very worried about this uh, Guillain Barre problem and who was going to answer the question before they started their major investment. So that's really what I'm worried about is they're going to hold back stay on the sidelines until it's clear what's causing the Barre, and that's going to further delay vaccine development. Oh, well, you know, just as an aside, the, the, if you look at people with multiple sclerosis, when they're infected with influenza virus, qualified natural influenza virus, they have an exacerbation of multiple sclerosis, which is associated with an increase in frequency of myelin basic protein T cells, specific T cells in their circulation. When those same people get an influenza vaccine, which is to say a whole plate of kill virus, or at least the hemoglobin or immunization of the virus, they don't get an increase in those cells, and they don't have a worsen, which is to say, a natural infection is very different than an immunization, but you're right. I think we often, certainly regulatory bodies often don't perceive it that way, which is unfortunate. And let's have our last question right here. A lot of the risk factors you described as making Zika virus a fairly low risk affair on the continental United States um, would also seem to make it a fairly high risk affair in Puerto Rico, which is still the United States, how, uh, how, what kind of trouble is Puerto Rico in in terms of uh, Zika? Uh, Puerto Rico's had a lot of trouble. Um, they, they have a long history with dengue, never effective control of dengue. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be more efforts and a little bit different efforts than in the past, but uh, realistically, no one who looks at our lack of success with dengue anywhere is going to be very encouraged by it chances of controlling Zika through mosquito control. I hope that what will be a little bit different about Zika is it's getting a lot of attention in the media. These, uh, these images of microcephalic babies on the internet, you know, they really get a strong emotional response and hopefully that will translate into people taking this much more seriously than dengue, even though dengue is a more serious disease in the long run. Again, there's a lot that individual people can do if they take personal responsibility for keeping standing water off their property, maybe reconsidering uh, putting screens in some of those windows, especially the, the bedrooms so that there's a pregnant woman in the house, uh, wearing repellents during the daytime, wearing long sleeve clothing, even if it's a little more uncomfortable. I think especially if pregnant women can um, really be educated to do everything possible the risk can be reduced, but I don't think we're going to stop this outbreak in Puerto Rico by killing the Hades and just dying. Scott, I think this is the last question, but are these mosquito traps available commercially? They're not. That's one of the problems. These were developed a few years ago, and um, they're trying to negotiate with a commercial partner that to make them. I think Roberto Barrera, who made these traps, thinks that they can be made for under ten dollars if the right partner can be found. And they, they only need maintenance every three months. If you put three of them around your house, you keep 80% of the 80s chip guy. So if anyone wants to start the crowdsourcing for this, <laughs> please, please give the college credit. Before we stop completely, please look on your program.
more of them. I'm not meaning to be a tease here. If you read about Zika in the paper every day, well, you're not reading about Zika, you're reading about the opioid epidemic. We're having the third of the citywide public health grand rounds here this Wednesday at 5.30 with four true experts in this field, not hysterical people, people who really understand what's going on. It is sold out, which means all our 320 chairs should be technically filled. If you haven't signed up and you'd like to come, we will seat you if it is possible or give you standing room only. I want to thank, of course, Scott Weaver from coming up and his wife, of course, from coming up from Galveston. I appreciate Paul Offit and his horrendously busy schedule at CHOP coming over here. And it's easy for me to put on a suit and get up and talk. The three people who have really done a tremendous amount of work on this program are McKeeva doing our sound and light, uh, Jillian Langley, who's run out of the room already, and Jill Stahl. And I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't want them to hate me forever, but perhaps Dr. Zweeger.